Jojo Siwa says that she is going to welcome three babies via surrogate. Also, we have officially said goodbye to Joe Biden as the presidential nominee and hello to Kamala Harris. Here is how we should and should not talk about her. And Elon Musk says that he is a cultural Christian. We've got all of that and much more on today's episode of Relatable. Hey guys, welcome to Relatable. Happy Thursday. Hope everyone has had a wonderful week so far. All right, we are going to try to get through four subjects today. Can we do it? It's going to be a challenge. I'm going to try to do it all in under an hour. Let's go. First topic is Biden's speech. He gave his speech from the Oval Office last night. He said that he chose to, quote unquote, pass the torch forward because he believed it would unite his party and save democracy. There was a lot of that kind of language in his speech last night. Here is Sot One. You know, in recent weeks, it's become clear to me that I need to unite my party in this critical endeavor. I believe my record as president, my leadership in the world, my vision for America's future all merited a second term. But nothing, nothing can come in the way of saving our democracy. That includes personal ambition. So I've decided the best way forward is to pass the torch to a new generation. That's the best way to unite our nation. All right. So he is apparently recovering from COVID. That was the diagnosis that we were given last week and why he was kind of in isolation why he dropped the big news on X and then ghosted us for a few days, did not give us any signs of life. That caused a lot of theories and conspiracy theories about his health, about his whereabouts, even if he was alive. There were a lot of reports that claimed that, oh, he's in hospice or he is actually dead. Of course, I did not share any of those reports. It's really tempting to do that. And when people say, that this is a developing story, uncorroborated report, and then they just put the post or put the tweet out there, you really have to be skeptical of those kinds of people. Because yes, there is an engagement incentive to be the first one to say something, but it's not worth being first and wrong, especially when it's that kind of destabilization inducing information. Like we don't want our enemies to see things like that. It just makes things look more chaotic and unstable than they already are. And so he is alive. Now, there are some people out there who will still doubt this, who will say that this was maybe artificial intelligence. If it was AI, they could have made him look a lot better. They clearly put some foundation on his face to make him look like he had more color. They also would have made him, I think, sound a little bit stronger if this had been artificial intelligence. I mean, he sounds really bad. And even that might be a little bit strategic. I mean, I do think it's sincere. I think he is really struggling. I think that everything that comes with aging has just precipitated, it seems, over the past several months. But this is a really smart strategy by the Democrats to try to garner as much sympathy, as much pride as possible in Joe Biden. Remember, we had that incredible patriotic image of Donald Trump in front of the clear blue sky, secret service around him, the American flag waving behind him, his bloodied face, his uh, fist in the air. And that was the image that we all said was going to win him his campaign and then his incredible RNC entrance and then the speech. It was all humble It was different. It made people come out of the woodwork who were previously either undecided or scared to voice their support for Trump come out and say, yeah, I support him. I'm going to wear my MAGA hat around San Francisco. This spelled absolute and total disaster 
for the Democrats. They had to do something to take the wind out of Donald Trump's sails. I saw some people saying at that point, oh, they've just given up. They know that Donald Trump is going to win. Oh, my goodness. Have we learned nothing about politics? Have we learned nothing about the machine, the global machine that is America's Democratic Party? You thought that they were going to give up in July because of a couple of good pictures of Donald Trump? No freaking way. No freaking way. Right now, they are doing everything they can to garner sympathy, to garner excitement, to channel any feelings of patriotism and pride in country uh, into Kamala Harris's campaign. And that is why she is running on freedom. She just put out her first uh, campaign ad, and uh, we will play a short clip of that. What kind of country do we want to live in? There are some people who think we should be a country of chaos, of fear, of hate. But us, we choose something different. We choose freedom. The freedom not just to get by, but get ahead. The freedom to be safe from gun violence. The freedom to make decisions about your own body. We choose a future where no child lives in poverty, where we can all afford health care, where no one is above the law. So this is what they're going for. And they want us to feel as much empathy and compassion as possible for Biden. They want us to think that this was a courageous, selfless act that he is uh, putting aside voluntarily his personal ambition that he is passing this opportunity to Kamala Harris, who is going to carry the torch of freedom and democracy and progress into the future. Of course, the reality behind the scenes is much, much darker than that. It's much more corrupt. He did not voluntarily leave. He did not want to leave. He is very resentful and angry behind the scenes about this process. He was pressured out. He was pushed out. He was basically told, this is the option that you have. And so now it's Kamala Harris, who is um, a foot soldier of every far left progressive cause. She is beholden, not I don't think to her own party or even her own belief system or even her own personal ideology. She's certainly not beholden to the Constitution or to the country. She is beholden only to power. She has shown that throughout her career. She is beholden to Planned Parenthood and the abortion lobby. She is beholden to the so-called human rights campaign and the LGBTQ lobby. She is beholden to radical environmentalists. That's why she has used her power, for example, as attorney general to go after pro-lifers, to force pro-life pregnancy centers to advertise for abortion. She was the co-sponsor of that bill that turned into a law that would have forced pro-life centers to advertise for abortion. Thankfully, that was ruled unconstitutional. She sicked state authorities on David Delighton, the pro-life journalist who... Uh, the, who uncovered the corruption in Planned Parenthood. She had his home raided for that. She is an ardent advocate of the Equality Act, which would absolutely demolish the religious liberty and the free speech rights of religious institutions that hold to the natural definition of marriage and family. She is for the transition of minors, even against the wishes of and the consent of parents. She is absolutely anti-freedom. She is anti-fracking, which spells economic ruin for thousands and thousands of families and for America as a whole. She is beholden to China. She is beholden to Iran. She is beholden to Palestine. She is the most far left senator that we've had. That includes Bernie Sanders. She has a 100 percent rating from the LGBTQ lobby and Planned Parenthood. She even voted against the bill that would have guaranteed babies who survived abortion. So after abortion, the right to health care. She is radical. She is bloodthirsty. She is as far left as it comes, and she is power hungry. So when she says that she is for freedom, she is lying. 
plain and simple. She is lying. And not even if she is president will the Supreme Court be able to keep her in check because she supports the Democrats' radical plan to expand the court and then pack the court with progressive activists who do not care about the Constitution. Remember, at the end of the day, the Constitution is a piece of paper. It's not that it has some kind of inherent magical powers. It actually has to be upheld and enforced by people with authority. And so that is the future that we have with Kamala Harris. And we have to attack her from that angle. We have to attack her from the left, not from the right. What I mean by that is stop calling her Kamala the cop, that she put too many people in jail for marijuana. Stop talking about the fact that, oh, in a speech a few months ago, she called 18 to 24 year olds stupid. Those are literally the best things that she has done and said. 18 to 24 year olds are stupid. It's okay that she said that. That's like the most cogent thing that she said. Putting too many people in jail. Look, a country that is looking for law in order, they're actually going going to look at something like that and say, okay, well, you know, that's that's not too bad. I don't hate her for that. Don't attack her from the left. You're not going to get anyone left of center to vote for Donald Trump because she put too many people in jail when she was attorney general of California. You're just not going to attack her from the right, attack her policies. This name calling, this calling her a hoe, uh, this calling her stupid, which I have done that third one because I do think that she is vapid. So I will be the first to admit that's not the best strategy, but neither are the other ones. Like, let's stay above board. Let's call it what it is. She is a radical, communist-leaning tyrant who is bloodthirsty and the most pro-abortion politician that we've got. She has been in charge of the border for the last four years, and every single murder by an illegal alien happened on her watch because of her choices. Lake and Riley's murder is because of Kamala Harris. That's where we go. Okay, we don't need to talk about her cackle anymore. We don't need to talk about Willie Brown. We don't need to talk about Montel Williams. I love making fun of the things that she said about school buses just as much as the next person. But we can attack her on policy and we can, Trump campaign, paint a positive vision of the United States, while also contrasting that with the dark reality of an anti-fracking, anti-energy independence, pro-inflation, pro-nine-month abortion future with Kamala Harris at the helm. You can do that without name-calling, without doing the low blows, because every time you do that, you are garnering sympathy for Harris and Joe Biden. We don't want her to have sympathy. We want people to be repelled by her, to be repulsed by her. We want them to be scared of a future with her in the White House. And so paint a picture of America in which it is restored to her former glory, where we've got um, economic prosperity. We've got energy independence. We've got safe streets. We've got beautiful, clean cities. We've got secure borders. We've got intact, happy families. That's the picture that we need to paint. I think that Donald Trump and J.D. Vance are good people to paint that picture. I think their policies will lead us there, and Kamala Harris will lead us in the opposite direction. That's where we need to go. That's what the Trump campaign, I think, needs to do. I mean, you can take my opinion for what it's worth. I I don't have political strategy experience, but I am a mom. I am a suburban woman, I am an evangelical, and I do have my finger on the pulse of what this demographic is looking for. And I have people in my audience, conservative Christian women um, or Christian women who don't really know quite where they fall on everything, who don't know who they're voting for. And now you can make fun of those people all you want to. And you can ridicule them and call them dumb and call them evil or whatever. All you're doing is pushing them into the arms of someone like Kamala Harris or into RFK or into just being so politically apathetic that they just don't think that they can vote for Donald Trump. Okay, I I don't know everything that this demographic is thinking, but I know way more than probably most commentators. 
and maybe a lot more than a lot of political strategists about what this very necessary group of women thinks. No more name calling. Hit her with the policy. She is anti-freedom, anti-prosperity for the average American family. That's where you need to go. Anti-safety, anti-law and order, anti-security, anti-medical freedom. That's Kamala Harris. That is what the swing states care about, what the Rust Belt cares about, what moms care about. All right. Uh, let's move on to the next subject, but let me pause and tell you about our next sponsor for the day, and that is Every Life. Every Life is the first and only pro-life diaper company. We use uh, Every Life diapers in our home. I love them just from a quality standpoint because they're made of premium and really clean materials, but also they work really effectively. They fit comfortably. They are flexible. They last all night without any leaking or anything like that. We have never had an issue with Every Life, and it is so much better knowing that I am supporting a company that supports babies in the womb that supports their moms and their parents, their families, and ensures that we are caring for every beating heart. Unfortunately, many diaper companies are actually donating money to people like Kamala Harris and pro-abortion politicians. So get out of that and start getting your diapers from Every Life. They donate diapers and wipes to pregnancy resource centers facing urgent needs. This commitment enables these centers to assist families who have chosen life for their baby. You can contribute by purchasing a Buy for a Cause bundle on their website. Go to everylife.com. Use code ALLY10 for a 10% discount on your first order. Everylife.com, code ALLY10. All right, let's move on from politics and talk about some things happening in our culture. You know, culture is downstream from cult. Cult simply meaning what people believe about God, people's religious beliefs, their worldview that is always grounded in who we think is in charge. Do you worship the God of scripture? Do you worship the God of self? Do you wor worship some other kind of pagan entity, what we worship will determine our culture. It will determine what we think about social issues, and it will also determine our politics. And the God of this age, and you could argue in many ages, um, is this God of self. This God of self that tells you to prioritize your wants, your desires, your feelings above everything else. I've talked about this quite a few times. I wrote about it in my first book, You're Not Enough and That's Okay. And the God of self has two transcendent values that it demands that you put above everything else, that you submit to two these two main values, and that is autonomy and authenticity. You can hear that it has the same prefix there, that A-U, that like automatic, uh, autonomy, often authenticity, they all sound the same because it's talking about the self. So authenticity, it says you put authenticity above all else. That What that means is that you are prioritizing your feelings and your self-identification above all else. Whatever you feel is real, whatever you deem your truth, that is your reality. Everyone and everything else has to succumb and submit to that. The other is autonomy. Autonomy, you control your body. You get to do what you want to do. Everything and everyone is sacrificed on the altars of authenticity and autonomy. When these are your supreme values, you will, for example, in the name of authenticity, even deny biological reality by identifying as something that you can never be, which is the opposite sex. And if you submit to autonomy as your highest value, then you will even sacrifice your unborn child in the name of controlling your own body. Now, authenticity and autonomy are not in themselves bad, but they, just like every other value, have to be in submission to transcendent truth. They have to be in submission, namely to God's law. Yes, truly being yourself and not 
faking it, not trying to be something that you are not can be good as long as you are still in submission to what God says is good and right and true. Yes, autonomy can be good to a certain extent. I don't believe that the government should be able to come in and, for example, force you to take a vaccine. But again, our authenticity and our autonomy must be in submission to the God of Scripture. The God of self is a cruel God demanding that you do whatever you want at all times, no matter whom or what you are sacrificing on the altar of self. And a really good example of someone who has just completely, completely gotten herself wrapped up in this cult of the God of self is Jojo Siwa. Now, I think we've talked about her once or twice before. If you don't know who she is, she was a child star. She was a on Dance Moms. Okay, did you ever watch Dance Moms on TLC? TLC should be like, I don't know. I think what was it? What was it even stand? What does it stand for? The TLC, channel. the Learning Channel. It should be train wreck Learning <laughs> Channel. I don't know. <laughs> I don't know what the L and C should stand for. But it was basically in a lot of cases, not every single show on TLC. I enjoyed watching a lot of them growing up, but a lot of them were just like, let us find the most dysfunctional people possible. Put them all in a room tape them, put some dramatic music behind it, and bam, we've got a channel and a hit show. That's what Dance Moms was. I don't know that much about Jojo Siwa. I know that she got really popular on YouTube, that her mom pushed her really hard to be famous, that she would spend hours dancing and rehearsing and all of that, and that she was like obsessed with bows there for a while. That's, I think, all I knew about her. And then a couple years ago, she came out as gay. And it was very strange because she went from like way past the point that it was normal for her to be acting like a child. She was acting like a child. So she went from like this teenage child, basically, who still dressed and acted and danced and sang like a toddler to apparently this grown adult who had some kind of sexual discovery and decided that she was a lesbian. And she started posting about her lesbian romantic relationships. And she has just, I don't know if it's in rebellion to her like previous image as as this like, I don't know, kid star, innocent girl with like a huge following of young girls. But now she's trying to be like super dark and she's trying to be really rebellious. I would say even demonic in some ways. She has a recent music video, which I'm not going to play with her. Uh, her recent song is an awful song. It's horrible. Just like objectively speaking, I will tell you, by the way, even if a song doesn't align with my values, I will tell you if it's good. I told you that Dylan Mulvaney's song slaps and I was right about that. And but he's he's horrible. But I can I can be objective here. This song is objectively bad, just like Katy Perry's song. And I mean, also the values are horrible. It was extremely sexual. At one point, she's dressed up like a dark angel. She looks like she's in hell. It's she's talking about being someone's like a woman's guilty pleasure. It's just awful. Like the swing was just so incredibly dramatic. Um, And now she's not just portraying herself as some edgy artist she is also talking about since she says that she's gay that she is going to use surrogates to have her children here's how she talks about that saw it too because i'm gay as and i have to plan a pregnancy much different than a straight person i actually want to take three eggs fertilize three eggs and have three surrogates so Technically, they'll all be the same batch, but they would all be born separately. I'm gonna have my surrogates, my babies. <laughs> then maybe the little birthdays will land on different days and they can be like triplets, but like not. How she is talking so flippantly and so selfishly about creating human life is disgusting. It should be repulsive to everyone with a moral compass. And I'm sad for her. I truly am. I mean, like, she's a person made in the image of God. We should have compassion for her. I have no idea what she dealt with growing up in the spotlight with, like, that much pressure. I sense a lot of a lot of issues that have gone on there. Like, I want her to know her creator. I want her to know Christ. I want her to know why she truly has purpose and value outside of her fame and her audience and her image and her purported sexuality and all of that. But I can, I can 
know that and feel that while also being repulsed by what she is saying here, because it is. It is so simple. It is so disordered. And what we see about disordered sexuality is that it breeds more disorder and that it always puts kids in the crosshairs. It always sacrifices kids because when you mess with the natural order of procreation, the natural order of marriage, you are just going to get more disorder and more chaos. And what do we always say? Kids are always the primary subjects of progressive social experiments. And that is certainly the case here. She talks about them as a batch And that's really what kind of happens in the IVF process. And I know not every IVF process is identical, but we really need to start thinking about that. As we've talked about many times, how she is retrieving her eggs, which is hard on the body in the first place, freezing her eggs. She's finding a sperm donor, someone I'm assuming that she does not know that is not going to be in these children's lives. Are they the same sperm donor, different sperm donors? I'm not sure. And then she doesn't want to transfer them into her own uterus. She wants to rent the wombs of three other women. And so she is commercializing women and commodifying and commodifying and objectifying children all to satisfy her own wants. Uh, She is sacrificing the well-being, the needs of these kids for the God of self, for her authenticity and autonomy. And these kids will pay the price, not just in their reproduction, uh, but also throughout their lives, because this is forced fatherlessness. The two components needed to make a baby are also the two people needed to raise a baby. Science tells us something. God who created science tells us something about what is needed, not just to create those children, but to raise those children in a healthy way. And she is forcing these kids to be fatherless. She is forcing them into an unstable environment for no other reason except she wants to. Look, children are not a right. The desire to have children is good. And in fact, like, it's so crazy how we think about sexuality and identity, Like how come someone's desire, like a woman's desire like this, Jojo Siwa, which is good and natural for her to have children. Why doesn't that tell her anything about what her identity is? Why is it only her sexual feeling that gets to determine her so-called orientation and the way she orders her life? Why is her sexual lust more important than a much more profound and a much more telling desire to have a child? Maybe if you have this desire to have a child, that is telling you who you are and what your body is for, in part. Obviously, that's not the only thing that determines what our bodies are for or our identity, but it's a big part of it. It's a huge part of being a woman. Why is it your lust That gets to be in the driver's seat of your life and not this innate desire that you have to have children. And if you want to have children, do it the right way. Get married to a man and have kids that way. Or at the very least, if you're not going to do that because you think that your lust determines your identity, then don't force kids to be fatherless. At least don't do that. At least put their well-being above your wants. Kids are gifts. They are not Rights Just because you have a good desire does not justify the ends, which is the unethical IVF process, which involves eugenics and also the renting of wombs, which is unethical, and also the forced fatherlessness, which is just immoral. Now, speaking of um, life inside the womb and the dignity of unborn children, and speaking of TLC also. We've got two TLC vets on the episode today, Uh, Tori and Zach Roloff. Now, you probably know the name Zach Roloff from the show Little People, Big World. That was a good one. I watched that. Um, They are catching some heat on Instagram because a clip they shared of their uh, from their podcast where they shared their pro-life perspective. So we'll get into that in just a second and some of the absolutely unhinged comments but let me pause and tell you about our second sponsor and that is covenant eye so we talked about this yesterday when we were talking about chris tyson and just the dangers of pornography it ruins hearts and minds and souls and bodies relationships marriages it steals the innocence of children we should be doing everything that we can in our lives and our families' lives our children's lives to protect ourselves 
from pornography and porn addiction. Covenant Eyes is an incredible software that you can download into all of your devices that blocks porn. It also comes with something called the Victory app where you can have a trusted accountability partner that actually sees everything that you're looking at on your devices. It gets a, They get a report at the end of the day and that just makes sure that you are walking in purity in this way. They've helped over 1.5 million people fight against porn addiction. You can sign up at covenanteyes.com slash Allie uh, for a free 30-day trial. Covenanteyes.com slash Allie. Okay, this just in from Brie, actually, is that Dance Moms was not, it was not on, um, it was not on TLC, right? It was on Lifetime. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. <laughs> yeah, that's right. <laughs> okay. Sorry. Well, Lifetime had its own chaos. Um, yeah. Okay. I just wanted to correct the record on that. But Little People Big World was definitely on TLC. And uh, a lot of the people from the show still have very prominent platforms. And as far as I know, I think all the kids from the show are Christians and are very outspoken about that, which is awesome. So Tori and Zach Roloff, they have a podcast called Raising Heights. And in a recent episode, um, they shared their journey of loss due to miscarriage. And they were hoping that their story would help others navigate similar experiences. And she said in the midst of that, that she realized what her stance on abortion should be. Here's what she said, SOT3. To me, when you get pregnant, that's a baby, you know? And so when we lost that baby, it was like, we just lost a part of our family previous to this situation i was very apolitical but i think being in that room and being as traumatized as i was it became black and white for me in that room i'm not okay with this like i'm i would never choose to be in this room and i don't understand how somebody could choose to be in that room you know yes you have all these you know smaller percentages you know women get pregnant rape and all those things very terrible the the you know, majority, the majority yeah. of people that I get, if I go out and have beers at the bar and drink and drive, get in an accident, I'm going to jail. You know, it's a consequence I chose. So, right. and we don't think about this, that the choice to have sex, that was the choice. We want to choose consequence, the outcome. And that's where I struggle to like get on board with any of the like, oh, it's healthcare, it's healthcare. It's like, no, 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 no. Yeah, I mean, obviously they're absolutely right. I don't have to tell you that. Um, and I'm so I'm so glad that they were willing to be outspoken about that because they didn't have to. They knew that that was going to be controversial. They knew that that was going to get them some backlash. And they were very vulnerable sharing about the tragedy of a miscarriage, having to get a DNC after a miscarriage, and then talking about how that changed their perspective on something, or at least her perspective awakened her to the right perspective. Um, about abortion and just how heinous it is, how wrong it is every single time to kill an innocent child. Um, And they also went on to talk about how the abortion issue affects their family since obviously the Roloffs have dwarfism in their family. Here's top four. How many people, when we had Jackson, they came in very serious and said, hey, yeah, you know Jackson's a dwarf, and we already knew it. We saw it on the ultrasound. Yeah, but that the way they had that conversation, because for a lot of people, the next conversation yeah. could be a whole could lot different, different than what ours was. Totally. We we're happy and everything like that. It's it that baby's gonna have a harder life. I want to terminate it or put it up for adoption. But a lot of people have that. So abortion, also, you know, for me, yeah, it, it's it's in the context of dwarfism. It, um. Yeah. Yeah. I don't, I don't like it at all. Yeah. I I mean, that's what people with special needs or people with dwarfism or people who were conceived in rape or people who were conceived in really hard circumstances, that's what they're hearing from the pro-choice, pro-abortion side, that your life was worth being exterminated, that you would have been, you're too much of a burden. You're too difficult the circumstances surrounding your conception or surrounding your pregnancy were too hard. It would have been fine if you would have been murdered. It would have been fine if you would have been killed. It's only apparently 
perfect and perfectly wanted babies that deserve a right to life. And you see how nonsensical that is, how illogical that is, that someone's worth, that someone's inherent right to life is dependent upon the circumstances surrounding their conception or what their disability is or how rich or poor their parents are or how much they're wanted. Like take those reasons to people outside of the womb. Do you think that you should be free, that you should have a right to kill a five-year-old because they're not wanted or they're in an abusive home or a poor home or because they were conceived in rape? Um, do you think that we should exterminate people who are outside of the womb because of their disabilities, because of their socioeconomic status, because of their size, because of their contributions, because of their sentience? Of course, you're going to say no. Of course, you don't believe that it should be legal to kill a 5, 10, 50-year-old for these reasons. And so if you don't think that it should be legal or justified to kill people outside of the womb for these reasons, why do you think those are good justifications to kill people inside of the womb for those reasons? It doesn't make any sense. You don't become like a different person when you go through the birth canal. You're still the same person. You're just a different size. Surely you don't think that someone's right to life is determined by their size or age, right? Or what they look like. I mean, that would be really cruel and really barbaric. Like you would be right in line with the Nazis. You'd be right in line with Pol Pot. You'd be right in line with every single author of the worst human rights atrocities in history if that's what you believed. So hopefully that's not what you believe. And if that's not what you believe, then you should believe that babies in the womb have the same right to not be murdered as you and me. That's the side you should be on. Unfortunately, the people in the comments of these videos do not have that mentality. They are not thinking rationally. They think that they are because they have been so brainwashed, so propagandized by the lies of the God of self, the lies of Satan, who are constantly using, who is constantly using the same deceit that was used in the Garden of Eden to manipulate women today. Did God really say you do this and you can be like God? That's Basically, the lie of abortion is that, no, you are the author of life through your bodily autonomy. Um, so here are some of the crazy comments. You can go. You can go look at their Instagram video. I encourage you to, actually, because I want you to comment something positive. I want you to encourage them. I want you to pray for them. I want you to message them. I want you to share on your stories. I want you to share the arrows with them because here are some of the comments. They're insane. Tori, in many places today, you would not have the option to have a DNC anymore. Do you not realize this? Does that fact change your mindset? That's not true. That's not true. Like these people did the same thing to the Duggars. Okay. More TLC people. They did the same thing to the Duggars. When Jessa Duggar had a miscarriage, she lives in Arkansas, which is a pro-life state. She had a miscarriage. She had to have a DNC after the miscarriage. She was accused by all of these brainless Redditors that, oh, she had an abortion. Oh, abortion for thee, but not for me. Oh, you have, you know, you have wealth and you have privilege and you have connections. So you can get an abortion, but you don't think other people should be able to get an abortion. A DNC after a miscarriage is not an abortion. Okay. It's not an abortion. Like you, I know you understand this. I know you do. I know you do. Okay. So just pause, take a deep breath, put your thinking cap on for a second. The reason that pro-lifers are against abortion is because it is ending the life of someone who is alive, okay? They've got their own independent DNA. They are their own human being. They're not like an organ. They're not just a clump of cells. They are a human being at the earliest point of conception. And we don't believe in killing innocent people, period, whether they're in the womb or outside of the womb, okay? A miscarriage, yes, sometimes it is coded for insurance as a spontaneous abortion, but no matter what the terminology is, a miscarriage is natural death, okay? No one took a pill to poison that child, to stop its heart. No one is tearing apart that child limb from limb while he or she is still alive. No one murdered that child. No one killed that child. That child died by natural causes. Again, I know you know the difference between someone dying by natural causes outside of the womb and someone being murdered, 
right? Like I, I know that you know the difference there. That's the difference between a miscarriage and an abortion. So a DNC after a miscarriage is removing a child who has already naturally and tragically died. A DNC in an abortion is a part of a procedure to kill a child that is alive. There are zero states that have banned, prohibited, restriction, a DNC after a miscarriage at all. Okay. You have been completely lied to if you believe that, or you just have deluded yourself into thinking that. Someone said, I'm glad you had the choice to abort the pregnancy that ended. My gosh. That you weren't forced to carry the embryonic tissue and possibly cause infection and damage to your reproductive system. No one is being forced to do that. No one's being forced to do that. Astonished that you feel that others shouldn't be able to make the same choice. Loved your podcast. I can't listen anymore. Okay. Everyone is entitled, someone else says, to their opinion. But when the government dictates in some states that you cannot have a DNC unless you are dying, it's a problem. I love your podcast, but you need to be more educated about this. The projection is just insane. These people are so uneducated. Most of these people couldn't even tell you what happens in an abortion or even what DNC stands for. It's dil- dilation and cutterage, by the way. Um, y'all lost me at you don't think it's a woman's right to choose. You can have every right to choose for yourself that you can never do that. But to make judgment and to make that decision for someone else is what is not okay. Like, you know, that's the basis of all laws, right? Like telling people what they can't do based on a belief. Every single law is that. Every single law is telling someone what they can or cannot choose to do based on an underlying belief that doing so is wrong or harmful. Murder laws, theft laws, rape laws, all of that. Like, let's take your logic to another scenario again. Like, why do you think that your belief, for example, if you want to use this logic, that rape is wrong should infringe upon someone else's right to do that? Yeah, because it's wrong, because it's harming someone else, because you believe rightly that people have a right not to be raped. That's what abortion laws are. We're saying, no, you should not have the choice to murder an innocent person just because they're in your womb. Okay, so you can disagree with that. The only honest stance to take if you are pro-choice is to say that you don't believe babies inside the womb have a right not to be murdered. And that's it. You understand that it's a life. You understand that it's a person. You understand that it is you know, the same species as people outside of the womb. You just believe that some murder is okay. That is the only honest stance to take, that some murder is fine to you. Now, if you don't believe that, again, I would just reassess your position. So go share the arrows with them. Good for them. Good for you for not only staying on your podcast, but posting it on Instagram. Because you, Roloffs, are giving cover to other people who feel the same way but are scared. Now they will be willing to speak up. And you who are watching them, their family, their friends especially, but also just anyone out there who follows them, don't be silent about this. Treat them how you would want to be treated. If you were receiving backlash for something controversial, you wouldn't want someone standing up with you too and saying, you know what, whatever arrows you're throwing at them, you can throw at me. Whatever names you're calling them, whatever consequence you're giving them, I'll take that too. That's what sharing the arrows is. And now it's time to share the arrows with some people who gave the pro-life perspective and are getting reamed for that and to pray for them to be strengthened and to not back down or apologize. Do not ever say sorry for something that you are not sorry for and something that is biblical and true. All right. We got one more segment, some interesting comments by Elon Musk. Let me make uh, two little announcements. One is our sponsor. And the other one um, is just a reminder about our awesome event called the Share the Arrows event. If you want to link arms with people and share the arrows from the enemy with them and to stand for truth and what is good, right, and true with other like-minded Christian women, come to our Share the Arrows event. It's sharethearrows.com. It's September 28th in Dallas, Texas. We've got Rosaria Butterfield, Elisa Childers, Abby Halberstadt, Francesca Battistelli. Of course, I will be there. Uh, You can buy an all-access pass. That means you can come backstage. You can hang out with us. That's going to be awesome. You can also do a breakfast package where you'll get to meet me, talk to me and the speakers, eat breakfast before the event. Uh, There's also some special merchandise with that. And then you can also get a VIP ticket. A VIP ticket is not only the breakfast, but you can also come to a dinner the night before with not only the 
speakers and me, but also some other special guests, some music, dinner. It's going to be really fun. So lots of options there. Go to sharethearrows.com. Check it out. And before we get into our last segment, let me tell you about our third sponsor. It's Patriot Mobile. This is the Christian conservative wireless provider. You don't want to fund the left anymore with your wireless provider. You want to work with Patriot Mobile because they are on the front lines fighting for the First and Second Amendments, for the sanctity of life. Our military first responder heroes take a stand for conservative causes. Put America first by switching to Patriot Mobile today. They have a 100% U.S.-based customer service team. They will help you find the best plan for your needs. Keep your number, keep your phone, or upgrade. Go to patriotmobile.com slash Allie for a free month when you use my code Allie. patriotmobile.com slash Allie, code Alley. Okay, Elon Musk just sat down with Dr. Jordan Peterson for a two hour interview on Monday, during which he discussed why he has come out against the dangers of what he calls wokeism, why he now considers himself a cultural Christian. Um, In the interview, he said that he was tricked into signing documents to approve of the transition of his son. He says he was um, manipulated by this in 2022. Here's SOP 5. I was essentially tricked into uh, signing documents uh, for one of my older boys, Xavier. Uh, You know, I was told, oh, you know, Xavier might commit suicide. That That was a lie right from the outset. Incredibly evil. And I agree with you that the people that have been promoting this should go to prison. That's so I was, I was tricked into doing this. Um, and uh, you know, it wasn't explained to me that puberty blockers are actually just sterilization drugs. I lost my son, essentially. Uh, so you know, they, uh, they call it dead naming for a reason. Yeah, I, All right, I'm, so they, the reason it's called dead naming is because uh, your son is dead. So my son Xavier is dead, killed by the woke mind virus. Hmm. I mean, just absolutely tragic there. And, you know, it's easy to say, how could you not know? How could you not push back against this? How could you not do more? But, you know, I I think he probably considered himself a progressive guy, at least politically independent for a long time. Believe it or not, uh, those who are not Christian conservatives have not seen the dangers of progressivism for as long as we have. And I say that as someone who has seen it a lot, you know, for a uh, much less time than some of you, just because of my age. Um, but, I mean, as much as people like to accuse Christian conservatives and evangelicals of being on a slippery slope and pushing a slippery slope fallacy and fear mongering and uh, being paranoid. The fact is, is that all of our predictions about the destabilization of society because of progressivism, because of the sexual and moral revolution, they've come true. And then some. And so you have to have grace and understanding for people who were not raised the way that we were, who are not seeing things, have not seen things from a biblical light versus darkness, good versus evil, Satan versus God. Uh, perspective for a very long time who are not familiar with Genesis one through through three and don't see things through that lens. Um, But it sounds like he has really had an awakening. I think a lot of people did after COVID. I think Joe Biden's presidency has been extremely clarifying for a lot of people to see just how far um, the left will weaponize the levers of power to go against parents who stand in the way of gender ideology to stand that will stand in the way of the sterilization of their children going so far as to take kids out of their parents custody elon musk recently said because of the so-called safety act that we have covered on this show that he is going to move um i think it was both tesla and spacex if i remember correctly out of california and move them to Texas because of this. You'll remember the Safety Act, which has been signed by Gavin Newsom, so now it's a law, uh, prohibits schools from requiring teachers and administrators to disclose a child's newfound gender identity to their parents. 
And we already know that that leads to suicide and abuse because Yaley Martinez, the daughter of a South American immigrant, the school hid her newfound identity from her mom while she socially transitioned at school. And then when she told school counselors, my mom's not going to go on board or not going to get on board with this, they removed Um, They went to authorities who then removed Yaley Martinez from her mother's custody. Yaley Martinez bounced around to different homes until she finally isolated and removed from the only people who really had her best interest at heart committed suicide. And that's what laws like this will lead to. And I think Elon Musk realizes this. Um, And I think he also realizes that, okay, the only thing to push back against this darkness is Christianity. And he's absolutely right about that. Here is Sot 6. I'm actually a big believer in, in, in the principles of Christianity. Um, I think they're very good. So uh, um, in what sense then are you not religious? <laughs> well, the, so Dawkins just came out <laughs> three weeks ago or thereabouts and announced that he was a cultural Christian, right? And so the question... Right, I, I would say I'm, I'm, I'm probably a cultural Christian. Okay, so... I, I, was, I was brought up as an Anglican, and I was baptized. Hmm, interesting. So we've seen this a lot recently. We've seen Richard Dawkins, which we talked about on the show. We can link the episode so you can go watch that. We've also seen Ayan Hirsi Ali. Um, she said that she became a Christian, but I'll talk about that commonality between those in just a second. Um, and then we have uh, Elon Musk, and it seems to me that I think Ion Hersey Ali, I think she may have actually converted to Christianity. However, in all of their explanations of why they like Christianity, why they're moving towards Christianity, is for practical purposes. And I, I do think that that is a good step. That's a good development. I think that gets us in the right direction because they realize that the only worldview that has the moral coherence, as Andrew Walker said in World Magazine, to fight back against the disorder and the incoherence of the progressive zeitgeist, the spirit of this age, is Christianity. It is the only one. It is in direct competition to progressivism. It's a view of creation, of the creator, of human nature, of male and female, of marriage, of reproduction, of the ordering of society, um, even the designation of borders and nations and laws and civil authorities. Um, All of these things create human flourishing. And it's got its own soteriology. It's got its own eschatology that is in direct competition to every tenet of progressivism. Progressivism causes disorder, disarray, and chaos. Christianity has a civilizational effect. It has an ordering effect. And you don't even have to be a believer in the resurrection of Jesus Christ to see that. However, it is incoherent (laughs) not to see that. And, you know, all of us have maybe been in a place of dissonance in our faith and our worldview in the past, but you cannot look to Christianity for its practical benefits without seeing that it is also true. Something that has been so beneficial, that has been such a force for freedom and flourishing for 2,000 years is beneficial because it is true, because Jesus is real. There is a reason why we order history based on Jesus's birth and death. He is that central. He is the keystone of it all, of all that is good and right and true. He is the source of it. Christianity is beneficial because it is true. Richard Dawkins has mocked the tenets of Christianity, but he wants the remnants of it. He wants the principles to guide our societies, but he doesn't want the belief that has led to those principles. I mean, Richard Dawkins is to blame for much of the mockery and disbelief of Christianity that has led to our God of self, godless culture, that has led to what Elon Musk calls the woke mind virus, to the disintegration of the family, of marriage, of the reality of gender. Go read Genesis, Elon Musk. I would say read Genesis 1 through 3, read Romans 1, read John 1, read Ephesians 1 and 2. Those are all good places 
to start. Elon Musk get you an ESV study Bible and come on Relatable, by the way. We'll talk about all of these things. So it's interesting to see this resistance to the results of progressivism uh, by people who previously called themselves atheists. Um, I also think of like James Lindsay, who understands Christian theology really well, I think appreciates a lot of Christian doctrines. At the end of the day, these people, at least Dawkins and Musk, and of course, James Lindsay, I think they would all admit the reason that they're not Christians, the reason that they're not religious to answer Jordan Peterson's question is because they don't believe, like they don't believe that Jesus is God and that he was born of a virgin, that he died on the cross for our sins in our stead, and that he was raised from the dead three days later. They don't, they don't believe that. Um, and so, but the good thing is, is that you can say, God, help me with my unbelief. And even the faith that we are given is a gift of grace, as Ephesians 2 says. We can't even take credit for that. And that is really good news. So pray for Elon Musk. Pray for his child, his son, who will always be his son. Um, pray for restoration there and pray for his eyes and his mind and his heart to be opened. Really interesting moment to be alive, guys. I mean, there is such a need for truth telling and for love and for clarity. And we as Christians with access to God's word and the gift of the Holy Spirit, like we get to be agents of that truth and order and goodness. All right. Let me tell you about our last sponsor before we close out. And that is America's Christian Credit Union. So there used to be a time when financial institutions had respect for their customers' values when they shared in helping to build and maintain our communities. That time seems to have passed. Banks these days are in the tank for pretty much everything you stand against. But there is another option. America's Christian Credit Union is the number one banking institution on Public Square. It's provided a full suite of financial services to God-fearing Americans just like you for more than 65 years. Families, ministries, businesses across the country have ditched the big banks, chosen ACCU as their trusted financial partner. Instead, they've got more than 35,000 branches and ATMs nationwide, so convenience will never be a problem. Go ahead, partner with a financial institution that shares and supports your values. Go to America's America's Christian, CU.com slash switch. They are federally insured by the National Credit Union Administration, America's Christian, CU.com slash switch. All right. That's all we've got for today, y'all. We did it under an hour. Go us. And we got through a lot too. Uh, what do we have coming up, Bree? Do we have, I'm trying to think of like announcements that we might have. Anything coming up? Um, we've got your book. I've got my book. Up. But got episode wise, what do we have on Monday? Episode wise. Oh, we haven't decided yet. We haven't decided. <laughs> I didn't know. We've got, we've got a lot of fun interviews that we have recorded that we are recording. So I couldn't, I haven't decided if we are going to put one of those up on Monday, but we will decide and I will let you know on Instagram. But yes, I do have a new book coming out October 15th and y'all have been so supportive and generous. It is called Toxic Empathy. Rosaria Butterfield reviewed it as well as many others. She said every page of this book is a lifeline to sanity. Girls and, and related bros, related gals and related bros, you've got to get Toxic Empathy when it comes out. It will equip you to have every single necessary conversation with the people in your life about all of the issues that we are facing this election season. It's not just about politics, but it does go through five political social issues and how Christians should think about them. All of the arguments, the tools, the facts, the history, everything that you need to rebut uh, arguments on abortion, immigration, social justice, gender, marriage, all of that with a really heavy dose of love and gentleness and compassion too. So Toxic Empathy, go to ToxicEmpathy.com. Check it out. You can pre-order wherever books are sold. Thanks so much. All right. I will see you guys back here on Monday.